Support for Outdoor Nevada comes from Land Rover Las Vegas and Jaguar Land Rover Reno. Proud to help introduce a new generation of adventurers to the diverse experiences that our state has to offer. Information at lrlv.com or jlrreno.com. Nevada, a landscape as diverse as it is epic. Where wide open nature and wild adventure call to the curious and the brave alike. These will be about 1,000 to 1,200 Pilot Peak LCT in about a month. That is exciting. I witnessed thousands of Lahontan cutthroat trout being reintroduced to their native waters. We have some reusable targets, we have some disposable targets. Our disposable targets are ones that you can shoot, blow up, and then easily transport away without leaving a huge mess out here. I aim for some responsible fun at Sloan Canyon. Crush everything up, turn it into a fine powder, and then process it through a solution process until finally it becomes a gold bar. Just outside of Elko, I check out a modern day mining operation. So you get a sense of what's the best way to, to pick a berry through your tasting of the berry and verify that. So our, our pickers really love this process. In Gardnerville, I visit Jacob's family farm for a serving of berries in history. I'm John Byrne. I have a passion for the outdoors. Today we're in the Valley of Fire. And I'm on a mission to show you the one of a kind history, science, nature, and adventure you find when you step outside. This is Outdoor Nevada. Imagine this, there's a whole bunch of woolly mammoth and then they go extinct and everyone says, that's it, we'll never see them again. But then years later, somebody finds one in a different area and they decide that they can reintroduce it into its natural habitat and it works. Well, that's exactly what's happening here in Gardnerville at this fish hatchery. I'm here today to talk to Lisa about the Lahontan cutthroat trout. They're reintroducing this into Pyramid Lake and other areas nearby. This is exciting stuff. The program to introduce the Lahontan Cutthroat Trout, or LCT, to Pyramid Lake has been the focus here at the Lahontan National Fish Hatchery for the past 20 years. Hi, Lisa. Hi, John. How are you? I'm doing great, good to see you. Good to see you. Boy, there's a lot going on here. There is, there is, it's pretty exciting. Lisa Hakey has been working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for the past 24 years. What's, what's happening exactly here with all this action? Well, here at Lahontan National Fish Hatchery, we have a captive broodstock for the native strain of Lahontan cutthroat trout that used to exist and spawn in Pyramid and Lake Tahoe. And Lahontan National Fish Hatchery has the original population in a captive broodstock. And today we're actually spawning males and uh, female captive brood. Spawning refers to the act of capturing eggs and sperm followed by external fertilization. The offspring is called a brood. We're actually spawning a female uh, LCT, a pilot peak strain LCT. That's what's happening here? Right, she's been sedated so that she's calm. How old is this fish? This is a three-year-old female. And how many eggs is she giving us right now? Uh, the three-year-olds are a little bit younger, but uh, they give about 1,000 eggs per female, maybe up to 1,400 eggs this year with the four or five-year-olds. Now, what do you do with the eggs? Well, so we have an egg uh, bag that's identified with that female, and um, it's been identified through Corrine's uh, spawning matrix previously, and Derek here has milt from a, an appropriate male, a male that has been pre-selected that maximizes the genetic diversity of this future uh, cross of fish. So right here, we're watching the eggs being fertilized. Fertilized, that's correct. These will be about 1,000 to 1,200 Pilot Peak LCT in about a month. That is exciting. And so the fertilization process, we have to let them sit and fertilize for about two minutes but all the data is being tracked on this bag through the process, through this stage, 
through incubation in the tank room. Well, show me that. Show me the other production. stations, will you? Absolutely. The fertilized eggs need to sit in the bag for about two minutes before they can be transferred to an incubator next door. Okay, so step number one, they get properly fertilized. Step number two happens in this building. What is it? That's correct. The fertilized eggs get brought over into the incubation room where those fertilized eggs take about a month to turn into fish. That's what's happening here? That's what's happening here. This right here, these are the trays of the fertilized eggs? That's correct, for the future brood. So we put the fertilized eggs in here initially, and this is where they spend about a month to incubate. These are disinfected, shocked, and put to bed, and they get a month to sit in there and mature. And once they become mature, basically turn into small fish, these are our future brood that we will, once they get to be a three-year-old, they'll go into the captive brood program. And this is all fish that stay on station. These, however, are production fish. So once they turn into uh, fish, uh, they stay in these tanks until they're big enough to go to the next step, which is outside in the raceways. A raceway is an aquaculture device that uses continuously running water to raise fish. So once the fish have spent anywhere up to a year in the raceways where they can grow out, we load them up into our hatchery truck and we take them out to Pyramid to stock, which is what we're doing today. So these guys are going from here to there, straight to Pyramid Lake. Straight to Pyramid Lake today. Hey guys, you made it, you're free, <laughs> they did it. It's exciting. I wanna do my part, can I help out? Absolutely, get in line, we can use all the hands we can. I'm going to work, I'm gonna help out. Hey guys, you're going home. You're going home. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> Once the fish are loaded up and ready to go, we all take a quick ride to Pyramid Lake. I don't know about you guys, but this is an exciting moment for me. Let's go check on the fish. Hatchery workers quickly hook up hoses for the transfer. So, Lisa, exactly how does this work with the tube? So they're connecting the tube to the truck, and basically that is the source for water and fish. And so Dan, up top, he pulls the, the valve, which releases both fish and water out of one tank. And you work your way from the back tank towards the front so that you can make sure you flush out all of the fish that may be hanging out in the tube. Hey, Dan, how you doing, buddy? Good. Good. So you're telling me that the fish are coming from that tank through the tube and into the lake? Mm -hmm. With the water, that's correct. So Lisa, we'll actually be able to see them coming out? You will, you will be able to see bubbles and fish coming out of the tube. Happy fish. Happy fish, they're free. Ooh, ooh, there they go. That's right. Look at them, look at them. Starting their new life in the wild. How many will we be releasing today? About 8,000 in the truck today. Years of dedication and an essential partnership with the Paiute tribe continues to bring the Lahontan cutthroat trout back home. It's amazing, isn't it? Many years ago, everyone thought that the LCT fish was wiped off the face of the earth. And then somebody finds it in a small little space in Utah. And now today, this lake has about a million of them. Nature sure is resilient, isn't it? But it never hurts to give it a helping hand. Gun ownership is a large part of the culture of Nevada, always has been, and that's good. But lately there's something that's been happening that isn't so good. There's, driving through this canyon here, there's all kinds of trash, there's shot up road signs, and that's not right. And that's why today we're gonna meet with these guys and they're gonna tell us really the proper way to be a citizen and how it involves gun ownership and recreation. Just east of Las Vegas lies the Mountain Springs Summit. Discovered in 1844 by explorer John Fremont, the summit's remote location attracts gun lovers. Hey, Randy. Hey there, John. It is right. brisk, but it's beautiful out oh, here. Oh, it isn't is. It? It's a gorgeous day today and a beautiful piece of country to be in. Randy Swick, with the U.S. Forest Service, oversees many of the wildland areas used as shooting ranges. In an area like this, what are the rules for, for gun ownership and possession? Well, we are, the National Forest is available for shooting. We do have some restrictions. We simply ask that you always make sure that you're not shooting anywhere near a developed area that has campgrounds, picnic areas. But the other key thing too is that whatever you bring in to shoot at or with, 
that you make sure you pack it back out. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because we're, we're in just this beautiful country here, but we come to this spot in this canyon and I see just trash and shells everywhere. Is this a growing problem or what do we got here? Well, it's been a long-standing issue at this site. It's a very popular shooting area. Obviously, you can see by the amount of material and debris that's been left, people just come. And to give you some idea, John, about uh, six months ago, we had 105 volunteers come in here and actually clean up this entire site to the point that actually none of this was here and this was all basically picked up. Uh, now you see here, just six months later, we've got debris scattered all over You're the place again. You're kidding yeah. me. Yeah, I think our hope would be that people take a better stewardship role with public lands. Over 80% of Nevada's land is public, so think of it as your own backyard. Thank you. I'll pass you off to Eric. I think he can give you some real good instruction about responsible shooting. All right. All right. Thank Great. you, Eddie, for everything that you do. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you, Eric. it. Eric, it's a pleasure meeting you. Thanks nice for meeting you, too. Today. My pleasure. Eric Brashear is the big shot at Shoot Las Vegas, a mobile range where you can enjoy shooting outdoors with the props of an indoor facility. So what we're going to talk about is different target selection. We have some reusable targets. We have some disposable targets. Our disposable targets are ones that you can shoot, blow up, and then easily transport away without leaving a huge mess out here. While bearing 70 different types of guns, Shoot Las Vegas primarily aims for safety and environmental responsibility. Well, this is interesting. Uh, yeah. What, what, tell me about the thing we're standing in here. What so is this it? is our mobile firing line. And uh, what we do is we bring out more than 50 guns on board here between rifles and handguns over here. And we get to be sheltered from the elements, the cold, the wind, the rain, and the heat in Las Vegas here. This is great because under your supervision, people can do safe exactly. recreation. There's still some, some basic fundamentals that we can do here that, uh, that you can do whether you're in a trailer or not. To collect shells, we collect the shells in the trailer. You can lay out a tarp out on the ground to collect your shells when you're just out here shooting. Eric gives me a safety briefing and I shoot for my first target. I think we're going to do the uh, Dirty Harry. Okay. The Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum. Most powerful handgun in the world. <coughs> when used properly, it'll remove the fingerprints. It's going to have a, a nice kick to it, so you want to make sure you keep your wrists tight. Nice tight wrists. Good. You got a good stance, good hold. Oh! So you're pulling the trigger, you just want to squeeze the trigger. If you want, you can use this thumb and pull the hammer back. There you go. So now it's going to be a nice light touch, but you'll be more accurate. Wow. Very close. Good job. Hey, not bad for a first shot. I advanced to the next level, a Smith & Wesson 500. So we're going to put one round in here to begin with. Okay, nice tight grip, thumbs down, nice tight wrists, okay? Okay. Go ahead and hold it, finger off the trigger till you're ready to shoot. A little higher up with your grip, stick this finger out straight, your trigger finger out straight. There you go, okay. Nice tight grip, okay, you're good. So remember, it's gonna have a big kick, okay? Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> Boy, I don't know if that translated. The power of that was, how did I do? Did I hit the target? Uh, you hit the target. I hit the target. Which is pretty amazing with that gun. I highly recommend having a guy like this around to really show you the ropes. It just changes the experience. That is so powerful, wow. It's time to bring out the big guns, literally. A fully automatic machine gun with a retractable stock. Now, here's a little something you get to do that uh, most people don't get to and you shoot a fully automatic machine gun. Wow. This is the HK94 converted to fully automatic, which makes it an MP5. This is actually one of the coolest, nicest machine, fully automatic machine guns to shoot. Nice tight grip, finger off the trigger till you're ready to shoot. Nice tight grip up here, tight against your shoulder. You're gonna bend your left knee and you're gonna lean into it like an action hero. Wow. Because when you, remember, when you fire a gun, gun kicks, fully automatic machine guns kick, kick, kick. You can look through this little hole and line up that sight but I recommend you fire the first few bursts, not trying to aim. Good job. Wow. You wow. hit the target. It's a lot harder to aim, isn't it? I'm really getting a respect for you and these weapons 
in a way that I feel is uh, safe and appropriate. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's a lot more, I've never been a gun guy, and until about three years ago, I had the opportunity to go out and shoot these things, and I, I sort of fell in love with them. I shoot a few other automatic weapons and a shotgun, and then it's time to holster the firearms. All the shells end up inside the trailer, leaving just the targets to pick up. So this is the easiest part about bringing your own targets out, is it's so nice to get to use them over again, and uh, you know, easy to pick up and take with us. There you go. It's just not that hard. So as you can see, we had just as much fun as anybody that came out here and trashed the place. We did it responsibly, we had a great time, and we made it a little better by the time that we left. Everybody knows that mining and the state of Nevada go hand in hand, but so often we think about what it was like back in the day. You know, donkeys. But how do they do it today? Well, right now I'm at the Newmont Gold Quarry Mine just outside of Elko, and we get to find out how that big thing gets gold out of them our hills. Newmont Mining was established in 1921. The corporation has over 28,000 employees spread across the globe. Thank you so much for having me out here today. Absolutely, nice to have you. This is awesome. What are some of the things we're going to see today? So today we're at Newmont's Gold Quarry Operations, and we're going to see a large haul truck, the big equipment that we use in the process, and then we're going to go out to Gold Quarry to the overlook and see out along the open pit, and then we'll head over to the process to see what goes on in the mills. Lisa Becker works as the mine's external relations specialist, and she's the one showing me the gold. And what I think is great about this place is that you actually have tours once a we month? We do. We provide public tours. They're free, which is a great perk. And we do those on a monthly basis. So once a month, we'll bring folks out from Elko to the mine site. We'll tour them around, show them everything you're going to see today. And then we'll uh, take them back to town. Newmont conducts approximately 75 public and private tours a year. It's an opportunity to showcase sustainable modern mining techniques and to invite the community to interact with the corporation. Now tell me about these trucks, they're humongous. The trucks that we use are very large. They're 793D haul trucks. They can hold 240 tons in one truck load. And they're all Caterpillar trucks. They use tires that are 12 feet tall. Um, so they're really significant in size. And how, how often do you refuel them? They have to be refueled about every 24 hours. They burn 44 gallons of diesel an hour, um, so our diesel bill is very significant for the operations around here. Incredible. And the actual mine itself, thats it's huge as well. It is. The, the open pit operation that we have here is very large. It's about a mile and a half across uh, by about 1.2 miles and about 1,800 feet deep. So it's pretty significant in size. The corporation has mined this pit since the early 1980s. The pit produces up to 50,000 tons of rock per day. What about the processing area? What happens there? So once the material comes out of the open pit, we take it over to one of our many processing facilities. Depending on the ore type, the mineral type, um, it might have to be processed a particular way. Ore is a rock with a high concentration of minerals. Newmont tests each load to determine if the ore is high or low grade. So we might take it over to a leach pad or we might take it over to the mill where they'll grind it down using steel balls, crush everything up, turn it into a fine powder, and then process it through a solution process until finally it becomes a gold bar. Once the ore is mined, there's a lengthy process of extracting the precious metal. Once extracted, the metal is placed in a 2100 degree oven, melted into a liquid, and poured into bars. Generally speaking, how much gold does the whole mine produce annually? So in, in uh, Nevada, Newmont produces somewhere around one and a half million ounces a year. Nevada is the number one state in the U.S. for gold extraction, representing more than 74 percent of the national production. Mining in Nevada has certainly come a long way from a lone miner with a donkey and a pickaxe. This has been I've always wanted to do this, and you've lightened my bucket list. So thank you so much for having me out here today. Yes, thank you. <laughs> this is great. All right, let's uh, find out what else is up the road on Outdoor Nevada. Blackberries, blueberries, raspberries. The sweet side of Nevada, right here at the Jacobs Family Berry Farm. Diana. Hey, how are you? Good, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Jack, how are you? Welcome to our berry farm. 
Meet Jack and Diana Jacobs, the owners of this little piece of heaven since 2002. So I saw the barn. I got to take a look at that first. Do you mind? I'd love to. Let's go do it. Great, Jack. I'll see you in just a minute. We'll talk berries. In the late 1880s, a newlywed couple from Germany bought this land and slowly expanded it into the farm it is today. These doors, they're enormous. They are, aren't they? They made things big and strong. And you know, if you look carefully up at the beams, it's put together with pegs. There's, there are no nails. So the public can come and see this as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, and we do weddings in here. So a lot of the public has been in here having a good time. Now, what is this over here with the well, this, belts? and? This is essentially a little conveyor belt. The grain would be dumped into here. The belt would take it up into a chute, a diagonal chute that would take it over into this building part, which is a granary. And there's one on the other side too, so the, the chute could swing over to either side. And then what happens? The, the grain goes up. up. It goes into the granary, and they would sell in this drive-through portion of the barn. Come, you can lift it up, and the grain would come out into the bags, and they pay for it. Even back then, they had drive throughs They did. Isn't that fun? A drive through in the 1800s? I guess some things never change. This barn is magnificent, but it's huge. How big is it? It's over 5,000 square feet. <laughs> when do you ever see that? <laughs> never. Never see never that. Never see oh, that. Beautiful. Yeah. There was a lot going on at the ranch. 20 farmhands worked here tending to the creamery, livestock, and agriculture, as well as cutting and selling ice. Boy, there's just a, a whole story behind this, isn't there? There is, there is. The, the family that was here had eight children and they all worked the ranch and everybody worked so hard in those days. The animals, you know, did the, the heavy lifting with the wagons, but it was, it was both fun and hard work for that family. Boy, everything that's just come around since then, everything that's yes. happened, but it's still standing here. Yeah, it's just the yeah. circle of life, and isn't it? It is. Family and friends, that's what it's all about. And this, this barn has really been a big part of that for the, in the valley for a long time. Well, speaking of family, I think Jack's waiting. Let's oh, go see him. Let's go see him. <laughs> <laughs> this barn is just a berry on top. Now I better go see what makes this farm so famous. This was an alfalfa field, and we knew it was a lot of work to take care of an alfalfa, and we didn't get much from it. I thought, what better to grow here than berries? My grandkids love berries. Everybody loves berries. So that's, I did a lot of study, research, find out exactly what to do, and now we have a berry field. And what's the season, and when do people start showing up? So July through September is our peak season for, for selling berries. And over here you see our raspberries, and over here you see our blackberries. We pick them when they're exactly ripe. We don't have to pick them early, we wait until the exact day. We go through every day here and find the best berries for that day, pick them, sell them, and then the next day we look for some more fresh ones, pick them and sell them. Now, how do you know the exact day of these berries? So when they're really ripe, they'll have, let's say it's a blackberry. A blackberry turns really black, then it starts to turn opaque, and then it's soft, kind of like your skin. Uh, then when you pull it, it comes off very easily. But the key is, then you taste it. So you get a sense of what's the best way to, to pick a berry through your tasting of the berry and verifying that. So our, our pickers really love this process. Was this a good way to retire? It's great. It's great. <laughs> we have a lot of fun. The Jacobs Farm produces up to 2,000 pounds of berries every year. The berries that aren't sold fresh become jams and jellies during the off season. Tell me a little bit more about what all is involved in growing berries. You got to have bees. Oh, bees are critical to our operation here, John. Here, for instance, are beehives that our beekeeper maintains, but they're, each one of these houses thousands of bees. And those bees go out in the field. And did you realize that on a berry with all these little bubbles, we call them duplets, every one of those had to have been pollinated by one of these bees. And then they bring them back here and they make the most wonderful honey, which we sell here on the farm. Each little bubble on a berry, each one has to be pollinated. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. a lot of work. Can you imagine? So how would that happen without the benefit of these bees? How many bees do you think you have? Oh, thousands, thousands. Bees pollinate about 70% of the crops that feed nearly the entire world. So the honey that comes from these bees is quite unique. And people say it's, it tastes a bit like our berries. No kidding. They, they sort of have a, a similar flavor. They brought the flavor from the berry field to the honey. 
The farm is all about the berries. Even the honey tastes like them. And now, for the best part of my day, I'm gonna pick up some product. What do you, what do you got here? What do you recommend? Well, we have some essence, which is a syrup, but it's more than a syrup. It's, it's a full pint of berries in each one of those jars. And we have jams, which is 70% berries, and only 26%, they're really low on sugar. And of course, we have our honey from our farm. You know what, I'm gonna go with the essence. I'm gonna go with the red raspberry essence. Oh, you'll love it, you'll love it. Don't this forget to put some on your ice cream. Oh, you know I'll do that. My pancakes, everything else. You got it. Thank Enjoy. you so much for your Thanks time Thanks for coming. I have had the time of We've my life. We've had fun too, thank you. By getting to know the Jacobs, I get to take home more than raspberry essence. I take the essence of the whole farm. The history, the family, the landscape, this is what Outdoor Nevada is all about.